how our monetary system works and fails. Where does money come from? Is its value constant? Or does it change? Are there risks associated with money? These are all important questions because today's monetary system combined with fractional reserve banking has a lot of risks. It is vulnerable to bank runs, inflation, and economic bubbles, to name just a few. Yet those risks remain invisible to the majority of people. In this short educational video, we explain how our current monetary system works, where it fails, and how you can protect yourself against it. How did money come into existence? Historically, as soon as trade between individuals became commonplace, barter was the medium of exchange. Barter worked quite well, but had its disadvantages. For instance, there was a need for a medium of exchange that would be accepted by all market participants. Between 9000 and 1000 BC, cattle was used as a medium of exchange. The next era of money was based on coins minted out of precious metals. The ancient Greeks were the first to use gold coins, the drachma. Different civilizations in history, like the Greeks, Romans, and the history of city-states in Italy, have proven that the blossoming of these civilizations took place when they adopted gold or silver-based currencies. This timeline shows all dominant international currencies after Christ. The gold coin Solidus, for instance, was the world currency for over 800 years. It was used from China to Britain during the Byzantine Empire. At the end of the empire, the currency was issued only in silver and minor copper coins with no gold issue. Since 1971, the world is on a paper-based reserve currency. There is no gold-backed currency anywhere on the planet. This has never happened in the last 3,000 years. To sum up, what we learn from history is that money doesn't come into existence by force or legislation. It is, in essence, a market process in which participants decide freely which medium they want to use. It has to be easily recognizable and transportable. It has to be rare so it can't be easily reproduced and so it can act as a store of value. Gold and silver fulfill these criteria. They have an intrinsic value and are not dependent upon promises of debt redemption by a third party. This is why gold and silver are money. Governments have a track record of diluting the value of their currency. When empires collapsed, so did their currency. This was not due to the fact that gold was suddenly less appreciated by the population of other countries, but was due to the government intervention. When governments ran into financial trouble, they started mixing in worthless metals into gold coins. They could then issue and spend more money than they actually had. Like today, these measures led to the impoverishment of the middle class and fueled corruption and wars. It is important to understand that already back then, this process led to a massive wealth redistribution from the bottom to the top, from normal people without privileges to the elites with the privilege to control the currency supply. Does this sound familiar? Today's fractional banking system has its roots in ancient Greece and Rome. Banks and governments have been acting as an alliance till this day because the fractional system benefits both. Why? Because governments give the banks the right to print money. In exchange, they expect the banks to buy their bonds, which is nothing more than debt, so they can continue to spend money which they simply don't have. History has shown that governments are too often undisciplined. When they go too far, the market loses trust in their currency, which results in hyperinflation. In the 20th century alone, we have seen 50 hyperinflations across the world. How does this affect us today? In order to understand what is happening today with our money, we would like to use a simple example. Imagine you are living in a very small world with nine other people. Everyone has 
so the total is $1,000 and hence everyone owns 10% of the total money supply. One of those 10 people is a banker who is responsible for taking care of the money supply. One day, the banker decides to create an additional $1,000. He keeps $500 for himself and hands the other $500 to his friend. The total supply of money has become $2,000 but you still only have $100, so you now own 5% of the total money supply. The money you hold will buy half of what it could before. Although no one has actually physically stolen anything from you, half of your wealth was stolen by the banker and divided between himself and his friend. This is a simplification, and the banks today use their tricks to make you believe it is not happening right here and right now. However, it is exactly the same. This chart shows the devaluation of currencies since 1971, the year in which U.S. President Nixon closed the gold window. The whole world went off the gold standard, and an unprecedented era in history of mankind started. Debt is the biggest problem. Governments play an important role in our monetary and banking system. Why? The answer is debt. Most Western countries have piled up a gigantic debt burden. The chart shows the debt level compared to the gross domestic product for a number of countries. The red bars represent the so-called unfunded liabilities, promises that have been made by the government but which are not funded yet. Think of pensions or social security debt levels are not sustainable anymore. The situation is essentially dramatic. But here is the most concerning fact. Somebody has to pay for it. Due to these extremely high debt levels, governments all over the world have an incentive to help banks because of two reasons. The first reason is that banks are major buyers of government debt. Note that they do so also with your deposits. The second reason is that the money which is produced by the banks increases the money supply and reduces the buying power of money. Or, put it in another way, it reduces the real debt which governments have to repay. How to protect yourself. Physical gold and silver is an alternative currency that can protect purchasing power on a long-term basis. They should not be seen as trading vehicles. Many, many years before becoming the chairman of the Fed, Alan Greenspan wrote an excellent essay called Gold and Economic Freedom. Quote, This is the shabby secret of the welfare status tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the status antagonism toward the gold standard. The only way to protect one's property rights is by having unleveraged and unencumbered direct ownership of physical precious metals outside the banking system. 